Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second web debate in 2023. I'm really excited to welcome you to another discussion on AI in relation to diplomatic practice. And this time we're going to focus on AI in the context of diplomatic negotiations and conflict mediation. My name is Katharina Höhne. I'm the Director of Research at Diplo Foundation, and I'll have the pleasure to moderate this debate. We organize these debates once a month in the context of the International Forum on Diplomatic Training. And we try to kind of combine reflections on recent and new practices in diplomacy and also look at the role of technology. This is Web Debate 57. And it is actually the second web debate in a series of events which focuses, as I mentioned, on the interplay of artificial intelligence and diplomatic practice. Last month, we took a closer look at the impact of AI on diplomatic reporting. And as I said, today we are focusing on the, on the impact of AI on negotiation and conflict resolution. There have been a number of publications on this topic over the last couple of years, but there's a huge sense that things are accelerating and that we need to have a conversation on this and bring in practitioners who are currently experimenting with AI tools. It's a very important debate to have as things are accelerating. To have this debate, we have assembled an excellent uh, group of speakers and I'm really excited and very happy and thankful that they were able to join us today. So I'm gonna introduce them very quickly. We have with us um, Sana Hati. She is the deputy head of the mediation support team at the European External Action Service. She has extensive experience in working in conflict resolution and she explores questions regarding the usefulness of AI for fostering mediation processes. In the debate, she will be able to share perspectives from the EU mediation support team, and I'm very excited to hear from her. Then we have with us Danish Masoud Alavi, who works at the Innovation Center at UNDPPA. He is an experienced UN political analyst in peace and security, and I would say an adventurous technologist. The Innovation Cell has explored a number of new technologies and their application for peace and for fostering peace. In the context of AI, for example, there was an AI-enabled digital dialogue with citizens in conflict-affected areas, to just name one example. And I guess we will hear a number of those examples and reflections from Danish. We also have with us Dr. Anita Lamprecht, who is an international lawyer and Digital Watch Knowledge Fellow at Diplo. Anita has worked extensively on questions of new technology in relation to international law, such as metaverse or virtual reality. She will share her reflections from her perspective as a member of the legal profession and focus on the role of the private sector in her intervention. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from her and bringing in that perspective. Last but not least, I also want, want to introduce um, Johan Kubalia, the director of Diplo Foundation. And he is the moving spirit of our research and development when it comes to AI. I will turn to him for some critical and philosophical reflections uh, in our debate and reaction to our speakers. We will have about 45 to 60 minutes for our conversation. After that, we will follow with an informal part where we bring in our Diplo AI team, in particular Jovan Njegic and Anja Jalic, and they will help us to deepen the discussion on some of the technical aspects. And in this informal part, we also welcome your questions and interaction. This brings me to a very important, to a very important reminder that I want to issue at the beginning of this conversation. We try to make this debate as interactive as possible. This means we're looking for your comments and your questions, and we want to create a conversation around this topic and with our speakers. So please leave your comments and questions here in Zoom or on any of the platforms where we're streaming this conversation, where you're seeing us and joining us. We have a team of colleagues who looks at all these comments and questions, and we then bring them into the, into the debate back here. And for that, I have a very important colleague joining me, Sue so Sonia Herring which will help me collect these questions and bring them back into our discussion. And we will hear from her um, later. I think I've said more than enough. So without further ado, I think let's get into this discussion. And here I want to start with um, Sana and the EU perspective or the perspective of the EU's mediation support team. And from that perspective, um, what are current opportunities for AI to be used in negotiation and mediation? What can you tell us from your reflections uh, and your practice? Over to you, Sana. Thank you very much, Katharina, and, and, and um, thank you very much for this opportunity. 
uh, to be speaking today. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so to start from the from the EU side, um, the European External Action Services and an ISP2 mediation support team, um, we are grappling with uh, new challenges to peace mediation that come with the um, increasingly digitalized and globalized world, obviously. Um, but we've been uh, never better uh, equipped to confront these challenges using in-house capacities and through partnerships. Um, so we have our EU strategic communications division, uh, STRATCOM, that employs uh, 40 people internally and 60 externals working on disinformation um, only. Um, and our growing knowledge also helps us um, identify spaces where digital tools can potentially make a meaningful contribution uh, to peace processes. Um, uh, mis- and disinformation is characterizing most conflicts um, in the 21st century, as we know, um, with their primary intent to, uh, being to distort facts. Um, but our tools have also gotten better at detecting and disarming malicious um, actors, including adapting our legislative, legislative and, and regulatory frameworks. Um, uh, digital technologies uh, pose significant challenges to peace, but they also present potentially high effective tools uh, to be harnessed for peace building. And um, discussions often focus on risks associated with, with, with the digital technologies, um, but uh, significant EU efforts are also steered towards uh, identifying and capitalizing uh, on opportunities uh, that these technologies can bring. So my, my first point uh, would be that the, the EU is wary of challenges, but increasingly well equipped to identify spaces uh, where digital technology can make a positive contribution to peace processes. Um, and then and further reflecting, um, uh, digital technologies and artificial intelligence are, are tools, um, after all. Uh, and this means that they're developed, uh, managed and interpreted by human humans. Um, and the accuracy of, of the tools is contingent on, on what, is, what it is programmed to look for. Um, and in peace mediation processes, trust is rudimentary. Uh, conflict parties must trust either each other um, or the process, or if not both. And, um, and digital technologies are already part of our daily lives to various degrees. Um, and so is uh, AI. Um, but for digital technologies to play a positive role, we must acknowledge that people worldwide feel um, the digital era we live in, uh, they experience it differently. Um, so technologies in some societies are more associated with control and surveillance, uh, while in others, efficiency and accountability. Um, we've identified three main opportunities where we believe that digital tools uh, can add value um, and where we can bring a useful contribution. So, so this is uh, rendering peace, uh, first one, rendering peace processes more inclusive. Uh, second, improving conflict analysis through better use of quantitative conflict data. And three, enhance our understanding of, of conflict narratives, mainly through social media. So second key point, uh, digital technologies hold great potential, uh, but we must be certain that employing them um, creates greater opportunities for inclusion and never exclusion, uh, better and more accurate data and uh, an enhanced understanding of conflict narratives. Um, so, so we know that, that digital technologies can make a positive contribution to peace processes um, employed during some stage in the process. And we have, uh, we have some good examples. Um, so for example, digital dialogue in real time, um, the EU has supported nationwide online polling of public opinion as part of a digital dialogue process in Libya uh, from October 2020 to January 2021. And this was hailed as a global success story to push ahead in, in an otherwise stagnated political process. Um, second, conflict analysis and early warning depend on good qualitative and quantitative conflict data. So through partnerships, we've tapped into data and meta samples, um, uh, allowing us to quantify conflict dynamics and interactions among conflict parties. Um, and third example is new technologies for ceasefire monitoring. Um, the EU-funded HALA project in, in Yemen uh, support the ceasefire monitoring, civilian protection and accountability, uh, which deployed a ceasefire monitoring system to report various acts of violence in near real time, ultimately seeking to protect civilian lives. 
So key point three uh, would be the digital space, thus also digital peacemaking is immense and therefore it appears particularly important to focus EU efforts and to capitalize on lessons learned. So, so to, to, to summarize, to, to, to close, um, the next, next the EU will invest in building bridges between digital tools and peace mediation. Um, digital tools can, for example, lift the local initiative to a global um, arena and, and denote the important work of insider mediators. Um, we will also invest in capacity enhancing activities and strengthen exchange with existing partners, um, including forming new partnerships. Um, the EU organized a series of five modules for colleagues last year and is an active member of the cyber mediation uh, network. Um, our pragmatic approach to digital tools can be has prompted us to um, to be concrete um, by looking at practical example practical case examples and applications of digital tools that truly add value um, and be focused by selecting a limited number of priority areas um, uh, being positive by ensuring that we reap the benefits that new technologies amidst um, existing risks. Um, uh, and then we go broad by contributing to discussions within the peace building community on using data for uh, improved conflict analyses. I would close there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that, that amazing overview, which gives us a lot to kind of hook into for, for the later discussion. Um, these three points I find, I find really useful as an overview. Inclusivity, better understanding the conflict, and better understanding conflict narratives. Um, I also really appreciate what you outlined in terms of starting to focus a lot more on the opportunities and exploring them in a very practical way. So thank you so much for this overview. And I think it's a perfect bridge to um, our next speaker, um, Danish, who is gonna share reflections from the innovation, innovation cell at UNDPPA. And basically some of the things I heard in terms of inclusivity and dialogue, I think, some of the work you are doing at the Innovation Cell really reflects that. So over to you to just give us insight on what you've done, what you're currently doing when it comes to AI negotiation and conflict mediation. Certainly, uh, thank you. Thank you to Diplo Foundation and to you, Katarina, for, for hosting us. It's a pleasure for us to be here. Um, uh, in, in the context of, so the DPPA Innovation Cell is a, a unit that was uh, started in uh, very late 2019, early 2020. And our charter is to look at emerging technologies and bleeding edge research and see how they can be repurposed for peacemaking use cases. Uh, in that vein, we've, we've made some early investments in the field of natural language processing for reasons that I'm going to elaborate further momentarily, uh, but that connects to our use of uh, uh, these types of uh, technologies that um, you know, essentially allow for large scale real-time dialogues. I also hope to say some uh, some things that help frame the debate maybe and, and kind of establish uh, parameters for understanding how the space is developing. And here I'm going to be quoting some of the work of uh, a dear friend and scholar, Aviva Vadia, who's uh, at the Belfer Center at Harvard. Um, so to start at the top, uh, you know, our, our goal with, with our work was to be able to uh, understand in real time what uh, representative samples of populations and conflict contexts are thinking, feeling about a broad range of issues, be they uh, what to do next in terms of parliamentary elections, presidential elections, constitutional reform, the role of foreign actors, et cetera, depending on the context that we're talking about. And in that vein, we, we made some early investments in developing resources uh, to develop corpora in lesser spoken dialects starting with Arabic. And that's because we have a high density of special political missions mandated by the UN Security Council in the Arabic speaking region. Specifically, we develop resources in Yemeni Arabic in, in uh, Libyan Arabic, Iraqi Arabic, among others. Um, and, and, uh, and that also helped us in, uh, you know, basically these types of resources can be used to train algorithms, to give them a sense uh, of what's being said. The algorithms then work in the background to cluster uh, concepts that uh, have uh, and, and build a kind of semantic web where words that have similar meaning are closer together in multi-dimensional space than others. 
Uh, I can say more about that. I'm, I'm just saying enough for those of you that are more oriented toward computer science can, can see where we're going. Now, uh, it started in Yemen initially in, in about uh, the second quarter, in early second quarter of 2020, where we uh, ran a large scale dialogue in Yemeni Arabic dialect to talk about a range of issues having to do with the ongoing political process, uh, the uh, effects of the pandemic, and uh, also uh, humanitarian issues. Um, here, uh, we, we socialized the, the idea initially uh, in, uh, with a group of civil society organizations who then use their restrictive networks to propagate the, the fact that this dialogue was taking place. Now, how does it work? The way it, it uh, works is essentially think of it like a WhatsApp chat or an iMessage chat where you feel you're talking to, as a participant, you feel like you're talking to one person, but there, there might be a thousand people in the room. And the person you're corresponding with on the UN side, in our case, is, is often the most senior UN person, um, uh, you know, mediating in, in that context. So uh, usually uh, an, a special envoy or a special representative of the secretary general at the undersecretary general level uh, will be um, uh, uh, talking to participants uh, from across that particular conflict context. Uh, this is helpful for a number of reasons uh, that were outlined by Sana earlier. Uh, it, it maximizes inclusivity in our in our our theory of change. It reduces the number of spoilers to a potential conflict. Also, in terms of optics, it is beneficial to us uh, to be seen as connecting directly to people and understanding what their positions are on an ongoing political or peace process. In addition to that, uh, vitally, and this connects to my next example, where we deployed it in, in the context of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum in collaboration with the then SRSD Stephanie Williams, uh, uh, it also helps us gather information and data, uh, empirical data, I would add, that can then uh, feed back into the high-level negotiation process. So, for example, you can iteratively run multiple real-time large-scale dialogues using these types of technologies. Um, that then through faster feedback loops, keep feeding into the high level negotiation process. And in addition to that, you can verify uh, what the parties to the conflict at the high level may be saying, whether their constituencies, the views that are being represented by the parties in the high level negotiation, whether those views are actually representative of what the constituencies themselves feel. You can verify that directly. Now, there, there are certain key things like this to just to go into the fine details slightly uh, without hopefully boring you too much. Uh, it is very important to have a representative baseline sample in advance of running a dialogue so you have a sense of what the demographic breakdown is. This helps us uh, to try to make sure that the sample that we get in our real-time dialogue is on in the first instance representative and wherein it is not it allows us to re-normalize the sample uh, based on uh, our uh, best understanding of what a representative baseline sample is. So for example, if in our dialogue, 60% were uh, self-identified women and 40% were self-identified men in the dialogue that took place, and we know that in the country, uh, it is 55-45, uh, right? We can re-normalize and re-weight the responses accordingly ex post facto. I'm just giving you the most simple example possible um, uh, to, to illustrate the point here. Uh, uh, since this time, we've also run similar dialogues in Iraq, in uh, Bolivia, uh, uh, focusing uh, uh, you know, intensively on also issues uh, around indigenous communities there, Lebanon um, and, uh, and elsewhere. And here in every instance, we did what we could to run the dialogues in local languages and dialects uh, through some of these early investments. Now, uh, I, I just want to, uh, I, Katharina, if you allow me, I don't want to take up too much time, I know, but I just want to say a couple of things that just in terms of framing. So these types of systems, because I'm, I'm talking to a group that are broadly not technologists, these types of systems are basically collective intelligence systems. And a subcategory that I'd call you know, at least what we're using in terms of the, our use of the platform Remesh or uh, other platforms like Polis, which is another platform, they're collective response systems or collective dialogue systems. And the reason they're helpful to go beyond just the use case of conflict and mediation is because they help us engage in thoughtful deliberation where people's 
voices are taken into account, uh, where valuable insights are are gained, and divisive, uh, uh, sorry, common ground uh, is wins over divisiveness. And this is especially important uh, with the advent of the modern attention economy, where uh, uh, what uh, uh, recommender algorithms that form the uh, the backbone of social media um, uh, optimize for divisiveness, right? So, so in order to counter that, these types of technologies are super important. I, I will stop there to not take up more time, but I hope to say some more framing remarks uh, in, in, as the discussion proceeds. Back to you, Katrina. Thank you so much for this great overview and very specific and very practical examples. And just to comment on, on, on your last point about, about framing, I think we have to take these tools very seriously, even beyond specific conflict resolution, because globally they might help us to have better dialogues um, globally in an environment that is a very, sometimes a very complicated communication and information environment globally. So that is also something that that creates, I think, a lot of hope to kind of have a counterbalance um, through these kinds of tools and the possibility that they offer. So thank you so much um, for, for these reflections. And also thank you for hinting at the, the kind of technological points um, to give us something again that we can come back to later in the questions perhaps and dig a little bit deeper. It's very much appreciated. I would like to bring in our third speaker. And since we heard from two multilateral organizations, so to speak, I also wanna bring in another important um, factor, which is the private sector. In a lot of these cases, we're talking about collaboration with the private sector or developing some of these tools. So I think it's very important to also look at that. And Anita, you are the person to do that in this conversation, which I'm very grateful for. So my question for you, uh, what are the current applications of AI in dis dispute resolution in the private sectors? And from your perspective, I mentioned you're an international lawyer. What kind of trends can you identify there? Over to you. Thank you very much, Katarina. Yeah, well, it was very interesting to listen to the speakers before me. So, uh, yes, in the private sector, we actually, um, the topic AI has been uh, an issue for many years. So we can draw on a rich pool of experience and learnings. However, I noticed that a lot of topics keep repeating. This is why it's really good to talk about trends. And I think today I want to show you three trends that I've noticed and that I can also find in research. So the first trend is about the focus between technology and the actual problem it should solve. So in the past, the focus was very much on the technology itself. So you had a new technology and then you were looking for problems which you could solve with it. And we have learned from experience that it's better to use a user centric approach. So to identify the problems the users are actually facing and only then look at the appropriate tools, which can be very often AI tools. The second trend is very closely related to the first one. It is a shift from using individual tools towards uh, offering whole entire dispute resolution systems very often from one platform. So in the regard to our topic today, I've seen in research that it's very often when you talk about how can we implement AI tools for international conflict resolution, then researchers have a look at family dispute systems. And actually it's quite obvious why, because in both situations, you do not just resolve a conflict you have to work on maintaining a positive relationships, as especially in family disputes when it's a divorce with children involved. So um, the way how AI is used in this regard is very easily when it comes to case management. So it's about the onboarding of parties, the communication. It's when you need to find the right experts in drafting um, documents, in summarizing documents. Another application that is the most promising is the decision support system. So we can look at experience back from the 1990s. And here it's really about finding sophisticated ways of weighing interests. And I'm excited to talk about in more in depth about this later on. Another very important uh, issue is, of course, uh, knowledge support. So how do I find in the best way the appropriate information? The third trend has not really arrived in the legal sphere yet, um, but it's very strongly emerging in the industry. 
and um, what is really good to see when it comes to tackling climate change. And here I'm talking about digital twins. So digital twins allow to comprehend very complex situations uh, in their complexity and also in their dynamic nature. And I've heard in the speakers before that they emphasis on getting real-time data in, uh, in order to be able to assess situations. And this is exactly one of the big advantages of digital twins. The best example is mentioned is climate change. So there are projects by the US and the EU to build digital twins of Earth to tackle climate change. So what is a digital twin? Very briefly, it's a digital replica of an existing entity and of processes, for example, of Earth and the, uh, the laws of, uh, of nature, if you want to say that. And the comparison with the situation in international conflict is, is very appealing because also here you deal with a very complex situation that keeps changing and is very dynamic. And with the help of digital twins, you can assess, the, as you can learn from the past, you can assess and manage the present, and you can make predictions of your actions for the future. You run simulations that you can adapt because there is a live stream of information between the real entity, as well, which would be Earth, for example, and its digital twin. And here we can also use AI tools for their full potential because we have information in form of computable data. Thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing um, overview and kind of, again, shifting perspective, but also giving us three very concrete um, points in, in a kind of frame of, of reference. This brings me to another point I quickly wanted to mention. Already we heard so many interesting points and, uh, and, and things that lead to further questions and uh, further exploration, which I'm extremely grateful for. For those who already have a kind of a FOMO or fear of missing out, we will have a summary of this discussion. And actually, we will have two summaries of this discussion, one prepared by our own AI system and one prepared by myself. So I'm always competing with our internal AI. And so you will have two summaries and also be able to compare them and see um, what's going on there and, and how our AI holds up to the human or how the human holds up to the AI. Um, just this to address um, FOMO, because we already heard so many amazing points. I now want to turn to um, Jovan for some quick reflections on what we heard, perhaps, as I said, uh, critical comments or questions or any, any philosophical points that you want to bring into this discussion. Well, uh, uh, Katarina, you're risking when you're asking me to bring philosophical points and uh, that then it, it will take, uh, take some time. But let me let me just make a few quick reflections. Uh, so far, we focus on the needs-driven approach, and Anita highlighted it. It is important, it is highly important. We tend to be excited by technology. It is by itself toy, exciting, and uh, sometimes we forget what we should use it for. And this, for example, using AI for report from the events is one of the practical tool to, to do that. Uh, what is also for me uh, an extremely important issue is that we have to develop some sort of a public storage of the public knowledge and wisdom. Currently, most of the platforms use the AI platforms, especially GPT platforms and the foundational models are owned by private sector. And it's fine. It's a push for innovation, uh, for innovation but uh, we're speaking about wisdom of humanity, historical wisdom of dealing with conflicts, dealing with society. And the organization like the UN, EU and other actors should, in my view, uh, consider uh, approaches uh, to have uh, that, like we have a data stored, public data, open data, also patterns of thinking, which are behind algorithms and uh, other AI tools. This is going to be a major issue, in my view, as uh, preserving our collective uh, wisdom, thinking, historical, current, as a global public good, not only for solving the conflicts, but also for the benefit of future generation. Privatization of that field could be very risky. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jovan. Um, I really appreciate that because also when we talk about the, these dialogue formats, bringing in all kinds of information into, into the peace process, understanding the conflict situation better, what you just raised is a very important question. How do we preserve all this knowledge? 
for me also personally the question mediators have a vast amount of knowledge like personal knowledge knowledge they acquired in the field again the question how do we preserve this for future generations and i think tools can also help us uh, in that regard i want to quickly turn to my colleague susan uh, to my colleague susania who has been monitoring the questions and um comments i think she has one or two questions for us which we can uh, start to address and i will also have some questions that uh, have been um, burning under my nails, so to speak. But Susanya, over to you for quick reflections. Thank you, Katharina. Um, we have a good question here, which is, Dipl diplomacy is the best way to approach the world in all areas. What's the approach that can be used to improve our relations in civil society for a sustainable partnership? Yeah, so how do we bring in civil society in, in a very meaning meaningful way? I think we heard some examples um, in terms of... Uh, deepening dialogue, bringing in various voices. I think it's worth to kind of dig deeper into this question. And the other question I would like to bring in is basically, we have three extremely knowledgeable people, four extremely knowledgeable people in the room and three who focus on conflict resolution in their work. What is, in, in terms of the near future, what, what is the next step in your opinion? Because you gave us amazing examples and frameworks um, to orient our thinking. In your opinion, what is the next step? Where do we see this going uh, in terms of AI and mediation and uh, negotiation, kind of building on your examples? But where do we go next? Or to put it another way, what is currently missing that we need to bring into the conversation or the policy framework or the way we are currently doing things? So with these two questions, uh, which you can pick and choose and uh, reformulate for yourself, I would like to turn again to our speakers and basically go in the same order and ask for a quick round of reflections on, on these topics. Um, Sana, can we start with you? Sure, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the good questions and the excellent interventions from the, from the other speakers. Um, really enriching for us as well. Uh, so the first que question on diplomacy being the best approach, civil society, I'd like to mention um, our community of practice on peace mediation, which we rolled out in October uh, last year and which will be again um, rolled out um, in the autumn. It, it was uh, first time in a hybrid format in, in, in October and, and we're preparing for the next one. So we have we're engaging in, in discussions um, on on how to include uh, digital and mediation, maybe AI, but um, uh, digital um, uh, and, and mediation at least um, in our program there. So that's that's just one way of engaging with civil society um, on on this uh, topic that we are envisaging. Um, we of course have have several other um, other methods of engagement with civil society, more formal and informal um, engagement, where we discuss uh, this among other topics. And then um, the second question: uh, What is next? Um, what resonated with me was what Anita said about the first trend, uh, where there used to be a, a focus looking at technology and then looking for a problem it could solve. Um, and and I think with the increased amount of tools. Um, that we have at our disposal, we can we can look at um, a problem that we're facing, um, and then uh, think about what we could do to solve that um, with with technology. So I, I would I would uh, I would then again raise that trend that Anita already raised as as the next step. Over. Thank you so much. Def definitely agreed with that. I think also in the development sector we see. A conversation shifting from a tool looking for a problem to actually starting from a problem and then thinking what kind of tools do we have or can we develop i think an extremely important point um danish with the questions we heard in mind um over to you for for your reflections quick reaction sure i'd, I'd be happy to to address that and also maybe touch quickly on some points that i didn't uh, touch on in, in the first instance now I, I, we think that in general, civil society's role is absolutely central. Um, as I said, this is why, you know, with the first example that I provided on Yemen, <clears throat> I stress the fact that uh, our entire outreach process was through civil society organizations whom we'd socialized the idea with and, and in fact also uh, uh, co-written the invitation to the real-time dialogue with who then sent it to their respective constituencies. 
Um, we think we think that type of engagement is central, um, and um, and and you know, frankly, uh, we're we're unable to do our work also uh, without that kind of engagement. Also, because the other thing I didn't mention in the first instance was the fact that in order to actually run these types of processes in conflict context, we need to do we need to have a baseline understanding of internet penetration in a country or in a context. Not just that, but also some of uh, the kind of more ethnographic leaning practices around how the internet gets used. So for example, uh, is the internet mostly being used at internet cafes that have Wi-Fi where young men are showing up, right? And and how do we, how do we work around that? And again, uh, engaging with civil society to have adequate representation across all genders, it has been uh, central to our strategy. Um, uh, so, so that is that is very much, uh, uh, you know, our our view. Now, the other thing that I'm I'm touching on that you know that perhaps the other speakers are more understandably more narrowly, uh, you know, looking at conflict mediation and as such. I'm trying a little bit here, Katarina, to connect it also to the broader debate around disinformation and the information environment in general, right? And I'm trying to connect it a little bit more to how recommender algorithms that form the backbone of media, of social media work where they are optimizing for divisiveness. These types of technologies are optimizing for uh, 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 you know, consensus. So basically, for example, the technology, the platform we use, DreamMesh, allows us to demographically segment, let's say all the people in the East, the people in the West, and the people in the South. And we can see uh, in real time uh, uh, what, points they're agreeing on through consensus scores, percentages, what they're agreeing on, what they're disagreeing on. For example, if you say, should we have parliamentary elections first or presidential elections, you can see uh, what people in the East feel, what people in the West feel, what people in the South feel in real time, right? That's super helpful um, uh, for us. Uh, and, and then you can also see the unknown unknowns, which are, we didn't know that people agreed on this point, nor did they, in fact. Right. These are all extremely important things in terms of moving forward and to connect everything to what I've said. I, we, one of the things we're interested in is, um, it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say two things in particular, and I, and I apologize for how much time I've taken already. One is we're interested in what are called uh, 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 bridge based ranking algorithms. So these are an alternative to um, to the current algorithms that form the backbone of social media, these recommender algorithms. Instead of optimizing for divisiveness, bridge-based ranking algorithms uh, optimize for connecting communities on points uh, where they might agree, right? That's the optimization of the algorithm, which is super interesting. And that is possibly one way forward in addition to looking at certain structural issues in social media and divisiveness. And this also connects to the issue of social co cohesion and conflict context. Um, the other thing we're interested in more narrowly focused on AI and its application to negotiation and mediation is the use of large language models where we can uh, maybe not too dissimilar to what Anita was saying in terms of digital twins, similar-ish idea where we can develop AI agents that represent uh, either poles in a, in, a, in a mediation where each AI agent is trained on the positions, needs, interests of a particular party in a conflict and have that agent talk to the other side where there's a separate agent who's been trained on the other side's positions and interests and iterate with each other to see what language they can both agree on, what language is common ground and have that form the backbone of any political agreement that gets written up and signed. Uh, I can say more if there are more questions about it, I'll pause there for now. Thank you so much. Um, as my colleague Susanya said, um, the chat and the questions are um, are heating up, so we will have another round of questions and time time for comments. I like this question of are we optimizing for divisiveness and, and conflict or are we optimizing for consent and creating community? I think it's a very crucial question and a very crucial dichotomy as we, as we develop any kind of tool. I think it's extremely important. Also, AI agents to create common ground. Um, Anita, those two initial questions we had, or any other reflections that um, have arisen as, as you've been listening to the other speakers, um, any reflections from your side? Yes, uh, I will start with the second question. Um, what are the next steps? So in my field, and especially now with all the discussions going on with generative 
AI, I really see that we need to educate uh, the private sector, the legal professionals about what they are actually talking about, because we are falling back to the old trend, the first trend I was mentioning, that we have a technology and now we are very, there is the hype and we try to find a ways how to use it. Um, so for me, it's understanding what we're doing. And you mentioned that I'm researching in uh, developing technologies at the metaverse. And also I see here very much it's important that uh, an interest is raised among legal professionals, along, uh, uh, among experts. You, you don't need to apply and try everything, but you need to understand the mechanisms behind it to be really able to, to know what we are doing and what we are expecting. The first question I can only touch a little bit. So what I would like to see is to make the, the dialogue with such institutions like the UN, the UN easier for, for example, the private sector for legal tech associations, so that there can be a better stream of uh, information between the two worlds, kind of, and we help each other. And what I also want to pick up is uh, what Danish mentions in regard to the agents. This reminds me very much of the, the idea of Tim Berners-Lee back in the early 2000s when he wanted to build a semantic web and also have agents roam through the internet and collect all the information that is available. And I think here, um, something Jovan said that we have to build a kind of repository that is public with all our knowledge. I think here maybe the digital twin idea could come into place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Definitely agreed. And I think um, what you said about the legal profession is certainly also true for diplomats in terms of capacity building and the need to educate and have very profound conversations, maybe not trying all the tools, but having very profound conversations and being able to do so. I think it's a very important point. But as I said, um, the chat uh, has been heating up, so to speak. So I want to turn again to my colleague, Susonia, to bring us um, the gist and, and the summary of, of the new kinds of questions and comments we have received so far. So Sonia, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Katerina. It may be a bit uh, difficult to combine them all because some of them are on um, very different subjects. So um, we have our digital twins applicable to conflict resolution and mediation. We have another thing about cybersecurity uh, where the question is how to safe safeguard computable historic data in the face of malware attacks and Another general question related to the first one, to the second one, saying how to ensure trust in the tools and in processes is, uh, this is directly to the panelists, has trust been a major issue in your experience? Uh, we have another question about post-disaster situations and the use of AI, uh, whether it can be used to predict people behavior in post-disaster situations to define better humanitarian and migration policies. Uh, what three types of tools are likely to emerge in the mainstream in the next five years to, fa to facilitate conflict resolution processes? This is from Paul from the European Institute of Peace. And uh, someone wants our speakers to touch upon the role of technology in large scale public engagement activities, like Danish has mentioned, versus closed door negotiations when there's a much smaller uh, number of key players. And uh, a user has asked, can we use these tools in mediation context, not just in mediation context, but in other diplomatic contexts, like preparing multilateral agenda or discussing solutions? And a final thing, it's a comment, but uh, it was like, so baseline understanding and indigenous knowledge are helpful when civil society is engaged. So it's a bit all over the place, but our main topics are like cyber security, use of these tools in, uh, in conflict resolution and the trust in these processes and tools. Maybe that would be a good summary. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I also took a quick notes just in case. Um, I, I counted eight questions, very, very interesting. So it's a lot to pick and choose from for our participants uh, and spe speakers most importantly. So uh, there was something on digital twins, are they applicable? Uh, cybersecurity, trust, um, applications for post-disaster situations, um, three tools in conflict resolution that are going to emerge over the next couple of years, um, large-scale participatory um, approaches versus closed-door negotiations. Um, 
I can't read my handwriting for one question. I'm sorry. And then last thing about indigenous knowledge. Um, oh yeah, beyond mediation, um, is it applicable what we just discussed to other diplomatic contexts? Which I um, very quickly tend to uh, to add. Yes, of course. But let's see what our speakers um, are saying. So I want to turn again to our speakers. Again, please feel free to pick and choose what what you want to speak to, what seems most important um, to you at the moment. Um, and also thank you to our participants for these great questions. We have a very, very great board um, of uh, dishes to choose from. Um, let's go in, in the reverse order this time. Um, so I would like to start um, with you, Anita. Anything you want to pick up on in this particular question that was mainly to you about uh, digital twins? Over to you. Yes, thank you. Well, the digital twin is, is just an idea <laughs> he had for the legal sphere. But the idea behind it is really that you collect data and you collect them in a way that they that you can use them in real time and you can um, facilitate AI tools to their full potential. So, for example, if you are in a negotiation, you and you would have such a digital twin, you can could then maybe now I pick up on the idea of agents, send an agent through the system and, and that agent would collect the information. So it, it would be just a much more intelligent way of, uh, well, of, of kind of putting information together in a way that we can really use it. So absolutely, yes, it would be applicable to mediation uh, when we, as we, in the future, if, if ever such a digital twin or twins are built. Uh, the second things I want to put uh, to, to pick up is trust. Uh, this is a huge topic, and especially when it comes to new technologies uh, where there are not clear uh, rules, there is no regulation yet. And here, what I can see in my sphere is that, the, that there is a shift towards the companies. We talk about corporate digital responsibility. And here is always about trust. And I think that the main thing will here be again education because when I am educated and when I have knowledge I do not need to trust anymore because I know if something is working or not and yeah I've I think I've covered all of this and of course being able to build up knowledge and then kind of not need to trust anymore because I know everything uh, the systems, the providers, they need to be uh, transparent. And this is one of the big problems that we are facing now with some AI tools, that it's not transparent, what data are used, what is actually the purpose on opening a system to the public for trying. So I think here we really have to work on the topic trust. Thank you so much. Very much agreed on, on, on the point of trust. Uh, over to Danish for your reflections again. Feel free to pick and choose uh, from from these questions. Um, what speaks most to you, and what you can speak to most. <laughs> I I mean the the questions were sorry the questions were very very broad. Um, I'll I'll try to uh, do as much justice to them as I can, and and please, uh, Katarina, guide me and and Sunny guide me if 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 I miss something. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, you know what are I mean, people are asking what are some of the other ways that these things can be used? And indeed, I believe that they can be used for more than just conflict related negotiation. I think they can be used in terms of, frankly, looking at uh, uh, the, the passing of different types of resolutions in our context. Um, and that's because the way these technologies work, the way transformers work, the way large language models work, is that they they get trained on a, a data set or you, they can be trained on a particular data set where they're looking at, at how in you know through unsupervised or supervised clustering how different types of concepts come together and how close they are right and then you can look at what the the concepts and the language that either multiple sides are using you know i just earlier when i intervened i gave the example of two agents um, kind of iterating with each other, but we could have n number of agents iterating with each other and come up with the common language. In fact, one of the things that uh, platforms, uh, uh, collective response system and collective intelligence platforms like Remesh uh, 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 do is in the background, engage in uh, unsupervised clustering uh, and, and uh, show us what the common language is and what the common themes are. Right, but that can be done in more and more sophisticated ways as transformers improve and increasingly are turned to. 
Um, uh, another example that I that I didn't offer um, that kind of connects with some of the points that Anita was also raising is the uh, building a version of the UN in the metaverse where uh, conflict negotiations can happen when in lieu of, of um, you know, uh, the parties meeting in person because things are too po polarized. I mean, this, this is classic stuff, you know, proximity talks happen, et cetera, et cetera, or, or uh, because of distances or cost or security or the pandemic, whatever that is, where, where parties can meet each other. Now, what, how should that environment be designed? And here I'm, uh, you know, stepping out of like the pure kind of AI recommender algorithms, LLMs, et cetera, discussion. Um, oh, some of the insights that have been gleaned from intergroup neuroscience can be applied to how those environments are designed um, in terms of priming groups for greater levels of agreement or disagreement, not to take us away from the topic at hand too much. The other thing I'll say that people are kind of hinting at a little bit is that, you know, the reality is that these types of digital platforms and technologies um, uh, are, are, are not a substitute for embodied interaction. Uh, we cannot overlook the fact that we are an embodied species with bodies and skin and, and feelings and smells and everything. And there's a complex interplay and interaction that take play, takes place. And I, and I think that indeed uh, it's super important to, to uh, acknowledge that. Now, how does it connect with some of these technologies, these collective response systems that we've talked about? Um, I, I think that these collective response systems can be an initial step leading to, uh, you know, for example, citizen assemblies when it comes to issues around governance, et cetera, that are developed through means such as sortition. Um, one final thing, and, and, and again, I know each one of those things that I'm saying you can click down on and I'm happy to say more on, but I'm trying to be brief. The, the last thing I'll say is uh, someone asked, you know, these technologies should be open source, et cetera, et cetera. Indeed, for example, Polis is open source. Um, uh, which is an, uh, which is uh, another collective response system, collective intelligence technology that allows for large scale dialogues. Most recently, I was just talking to Colin, the founder, um, uh, yesterday, and he 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 showed me how UNDP used Polis for a twenty seven thousand person youth dialogue in Pakistan, uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, and I and I will end there. Thank you so much. Um, amazing, amazing points. Um, I took some notes, noted Polis, which I wasn't aware of. Thank you for that. Um, over to you, Sana. Thank you very much. And thanks. thank you for the questions. I've also been following the chat and, and reading them in detail. Um, the, uh, the question on are digital twins useful in mediation um, or negotiations? Um, was there was also already responded to in a way. Um, and then there was this question of trust, the element of trust, which is perhaps the one, the, the first key element of, of mediation processes um, uh, in, in general. And, and then this notion of how negotiations are um, uh, an intimate human uh, activity um, with all the elements um, uh, that, 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 that go with that, um, already referred to by, by Danish there. Um, and then this question of closed door negotiations where you have a small cast of, of key players uh, working out a complex political situation. Um, it brings me to, 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 to my very brief response that, that these, these tools, um, if you think about mediation engagement, um, these are, are tools that can support, um, but you do need that um, human engagement as well. There's something that you cannot replace um, uh, in that, so so these are elements that can support that. They can they can be initial steps, as as Danish uh, outlined there, um, or they can provide data or supporting analysis um, for mediation uh, processes that will also um, require the the human um, human interaction. I'm I'm not saying that they cannot in some cases solve a problem, um, but but in the in the big picture of mediation processes, I would I would say that 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 we need we need the two. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, really amazing responses. I'm very much looking forward to producing um, the summary of this conversation to re-engage with all of this and, and collect all the examples um, together. Thank you so much for joining us and for, for having this conversation. And you can tell from what I just said, we're almost uh, at the end of um, our time. We have about five minutes left. 
the way I want to use those five minutes is to give each of our speakers um, just a very brief moment for perhaps a final reflection, one or two sentences, if uh, uh, maybe something that is a uh, quote unquote um, tweetable, just your final reflections from having spent this hour together and hearing each other's perspectives and uh, uh, voices and uh, views. Uh, Anita, may I start with you for a very quick final reflection? Yes, uh, my reflection would be that we should really look at AI from an augmented uh, perspective so that it will augment our human intelligence, our abilities and not replace them. I think that would be my reflection of the day and also what I kind of got now out of the responses from my other colleagues, the speakers. Mm, thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, Sana, may I call on you? I might, I might, oh, um, I might go back to my uh, my my first first remarks and just the the last four um, four points I had. So so we should be concrete, uh, looking at the practical cases and application of digital tools um, that truly add value, um, and then we should be focused um, and look at priority areas um, and be positive and ensure that we can reap the benefits. Um, and go broad by contributing to discussions within the peace building community um, on using data for better analysis. Thank you so much. Great points. Um, Danish, final words um, from you. I would say that, that, that governance and decision making are changing, not just in the context of, of conflict mediation, but broadly. And there are a number of tools that are out there and methods such as citizen assemblies, sortition, these collective response systems, collective intelligence systems that allow for broader consultation, enhancing the legitimacy of decision-making that affects different polities around, around the world. Uh, moving forward, uh, I think as a global community, it's going to be super important for us to be able to, to for us to focus on and, and reflect on how do we come toward uh, this type of a bridge building across divides, across uh, points of view, and how do we optimize for that? And there are ways to do that, that also counter the epidemic of mis and disinformation and divisiveness. There are ways to optimize for social cohesion algorithmically, and these collective response systems are, and bridge-based ranking algorithms are one way to go in the context of conflict and negotiation and mediation, but also more broadly in, in uh, societies that aren't necessarily facing conflict, but are experiencing a lot of social divisiveness. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three of you for, for these final reflections. We only had an hour and I think there are some things we, we could only touch upon. And I think there's a lot here to deepen the discussion, which we will try to do based on this conversation. But for now, thank you so much um, for joining us. For me, it's been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation. I'm Sana Hati, Deputy Head of Mediation Support Team at the European External Action Service, Danish Masood of the Innovation Cell at UNDPPA, last but not least, uh, international lawyer, Dr. Anita Lamprecht. Thank you so much, um, the three of you. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think together we created uh, some really important points and food for thought. Um, and I appreciate it very much. For now, I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, to my boss, <laughs> Jovan, who will uh, lead us into the informal time. So our discussion here is formally closed, but for those who want to stay and deepen some of these points, we will have some informal time to have a chat on some of the technological aspects um, with our Diplo AI team on the spot here. And I will hand over to Jovan to guide us into the informal time. But now, thank you so much to our speakers. I really appreciated your time and insights. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Uh, what we are going to do, it was really inspiring chat and we will develop on some of these issues. We'll show concretely what we are doing in Diplo's AI and Data Lab, concrete tools, concrete uh, uh, projects and uh, demystify a bit uh, all discussion on artificial intelligence. Here are just a few slides. As you know, we try to visualize visualize these things and uh, when AI discuss uh, maybe it can help uh, this uh, uh, disparity in the size and uh, between small countries and big countries. Typically technology does not help but maybe we'll have a chance for that. 
Then there is a question of negotiation. Our topic was very broad and it was mentioned by a few colleagues what we are referring to when we say negotiation, peace, uh, mediation, multilateral, bilateral, business negotiations. And uh, here the range and the use of AI is very, very broad. You can have a very formalized negotiation and we analyze them like a UN negotiation when you have rules of procedure, drafting process. And I would say use of AI is quite considerable. As you can see from the shared screen, we did in-depth analysis of the typical UN procedures for voting, majority, consensus building, uh, role of chair, uh, role of moderator, role of reporters. That's one, one negotiation, much more open-ended negotiation and loser negotiation is negotiation that we discussed today or peace negotiation or, or uh, some sort of uh, mediations. We have taxonomy of about 25 different types of negotiation and engagement. And uh, you can apply rules differently for, for all of these uh, negotiations. One issue which was, which was important in, uh, which has been important in our research in this field is the question of, uh, of uh, personal skills, which is visualiz visualized here. And the more you come to personal skills, time perception, credibility, patience, self-control, uh, mastering, okay, mastering procedure, psychological analysis, uh, uh, behavioral analysis, the less AI can help. It can help with identifying patterns, but this is also what we are now currently doing research, seeing what are the fields where you can can apply AI more directly. And then there is a theory of negotiation, which is famous the zone of possible agreement, ZOPA. It's a bit schematic. It's very popular among negotiating scientists. Uh, and uh, I'm sometimes critical about it. You know how it's going with any discipline. They want to create their theory. They want to put everything in that framework. But it's useful to know. And as you can see from this, our comprehensive approach, we'll now focus on AI, what we are doing in digital field, but we are bringing uh, uh, inputs from the negotiating theory, from the behavioral science, cognitive science, uh, procedures of the UN. And that's, that's basically the key for having effective analysis to have all of those uh, elements together. One aspect that we notice, which is very often underestimated in this discussion, is cultural context uh, and the context with, between high context, high cultural context, and low context. Basically, the vision is, do you get, I'm now simplifying the message to what it is. Is it uh, what I'm uh, saying or there are uh, loaded meanings? tacit meaning, signaling, cultural context. And typically conflicts, especially in, for example, in Middle East are happening in societies with a high communication context with different layers of signaling from the, from the personal position to the official position. Therefore we are doing this analysis and what, what is becoming increasingly important, uh, we are trying to make clear distinction between complex and complicated issues. Playing chess, playing Go, playing diplomacy game, and my colleagues will reflect on the meta experiment. We raised a lot of hype around it. Are complex system with definite number of combinations. Negotiations, real life negotiations, are compl complicated. Or just to make analogy, chess is a complex game. Soccer is complicated because you cannot grasp all combinations of soccer players from referees to the mood to the ball to the, well, we saw it in Qatar, how, how during the World Cup, how complex it could be. And it's very important to understand and to be aware of the, of the limits. Now we will move to bit under the bonnet, what we are doing at, uh, at Diplo with the help also of my colleagues. And we deal essentially with three types of data. One type of data is non-structured data text. And here we have all Chat GPT, OpenAI, Bloom, and other framework, and I will show it uh, quickly. We then have a semi-structured data, which are so-called knowledge graphs, uh, where you basically uh, put some sort of relations between uh, otherwise non-structured data, and we have structured data, which are databases. And I now I will now quickly go through this uh, three uh, part of the our exercises. The first one is. Uh, uh, non-structured data and text. And we uh, here, for example, 
try to make to generate peace agreement. Mind you, here we are speaking about using the text analysis of existing documents, sort of chat GPT for peace. I'm simplifying, we use open AI and other algorithms. We combine algorithms and this is another important issue. It's very important to test, test, test and combine algorithms. And we found more or less the all peace agreements have three elements. It has a question of territory, who controls the territory, people, including part of ethnicity and political system. Uh, governance, democracy, and other, and other issues. And here we did experiment with Israel-Palestine um, uh, conflict. Now, this, some of the issues, obviously, especially on the Ukraine war, could be very controversial. But this is research that we, we, we did. And trying to see different co uh, combinations, territory and democracy, territory, ethnicity, democracy, and ethnicity. And uh, how, how peace could be document, peace treaty could be built around this. Uh, we did analysis of Israel-Palestine conflict around these three, uh, let's say, three elements and also uh, using some background documents. Here are background documents. And then we generated peace agreements, uh, proposals, different proposals, very interesting proposals, uh, about 10 different proposals, as you know, you can generate these days, but moving with variables. And this is very important. And I'll show you in a few minutes, how one can work with uh, with variables, and uh, here are the different texts on possible, possible. Well, sometimes Oslo Agreement uh, revisited, or uh, or those of you who know the crisis in the in the in the Middle East. We did also uh, with the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, which is obviously uh, much much more topical, much more controversial and uh, providing background document and also providing different analysis. Mind you, most of the input from the system were coming from the, from the around Minsk uh, agreements because it is 2021 before the, before the war uh, started uh, in uh, one year ago. That's basically generating the, the agreement around, around this, this, these elements. Then what, how, how we do, what we, what we do, here is the one of the part of our, our system, which is a, a speed generator. Speed generator can find overlapping spaces, for example, on negotiation of cybersecurity. And uh, here you can put a country and you can find what are the so-called zone of possible agreement between different actors on international humanitarian law, cyber crime, cyber treaty, UN charter, international law attribution and self-defense. What is here very important to, to highlight is that we put a lot of background work over the last five years in analyzing more or less all UN negotiations on cybersecurity. Just to give you the just to give you the hint and the clue, every statement in the UN general, general group of uh, you have a statement by United Kingdom, entire speech, related report, elements introduction, elements on uh, discussion, existing threats, those are topics, international law, what UK said on that point, including uh, including the emotions. Now, my sort of uh, a take on this and experience by discussing with our AI colleagues, initial lifting has to be very human intensive. Good news is that every next iteration is much easier. And another good news is when you have a good initial lifting in any field, you can then solve the problem of prompting, basically for AI, for chat GPT and open AI, prompting the system to, to react in, 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 in a certain way. This is just excerpt we, you see for every meeting we were analyzing all statements. Now we are moving to more, let's say, semi-automatic approach, but traditionally we started with literally doing it manually. It is also what OpenAI did. They uh, ask people to tag the texts. You need to do this. And now when you use ChatGPT and you make your happy, you make your comment, you're basically tagging the text and helping Microsoft and OpenAI to develop the system, basically passing your knowledge to this. And here we are very, very concerned and critical, as I mentioned in my initial statement. Now, in addition to that, we have the systems of uh, data sandbox, which are very structured system where you can 
in, in brief, you can get the structured data, normalized stru structured data. We have close to 1,000 data sets. And what is interesting in this, these data sets, we are trying to find paternity in data by ranking country. If country is the first, for example, if country is always 75th on uh, measures across this 1,000 sets, and on one set is the first, or it's 193rd, we say, aha, here is some sort of uh, analysis that we should do. This is a very interesting potential of structured data to use, to, to develop, uh, to put input into the, into, the, into the AI system and to use it more, more effectively. Therefore, those are just a few glimpses with a few messages. There are no shortcuts in initial lifting. You have to put expert knowledge. Once you do heavy lifting, then through iterations and through the self-imposed learning, you can develop it, uh, develop it uh, uh, fast, and you then you have a system that uh, essentially you are you are you are developing uh, uh, new new ways of, of of knowledge and analysis. For example, we use at Diplo we use the um, annotation system where you annotate the texts. For example, I had something from Reddit. If I want to, to uh, annotate, I will say, aha, this is important for my colleague Jovan Jegic and his team. And I will say, Jovan, uh, uh, I, I disagree with this. Now, what, why it is useful? Because by annotating the text, which is behind also our learning methodology, we are basically developing patterns and developing sort of bottom-up AI, which is very interesting. Our argument is that you don't need large language models always. You can have a small language models which are developed around uh, this type of techniques which can capture the knowledge of the small group. Ultimately, by doing that, we would try to make proof of concept that we can bring AI back to individuals and citizens and communities. We don't need to rely on big systems always. We can bring AI back to citizens and communities. Now, I'll pass the uh, sharing of sc screen to Jovan and Danja to give us some hint about, uh, about this meta uh, diplomacy game. Just to give you a context, Few months ago, it was all over the media that Meta is going to replace diplomats. Obviously, like it was hype, uh, but uh, it was an interesting approach to one specific type of use of AI for complex, not complicated system. And life is very often complicated. I just uh, scratched the surface. What do we use as a disciplines from diplomacy, law, uh, behavioral science? and what we use as a practical tool to apply it and to test it in reality. We use close to uh, 10 different algorithms, not only on op OpenAI, but also Bloom. Uh, we are waiting for new Chinese algorithm, which should be released uh, shortly. And this is the critical testing, 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 and making cognitive proximity between experts on one side and machine on the other side. And that's the that's basically a glimpse from our AI and data lab. Jovan, over to you for uh, uh, tell us what is uh, what is, was this hype, what was the reality, and what was hype in the case of uh, a diplomacy uh, AI game. Yep, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Ah, here it is. I needed some uh, credentials. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, let me uh, share the screen. So uh, this is a really interesting project of uh, of uh, Meta. They they uh, took some interesting approach to to this uh, uh, game of of large language model models. We can see that Microsoft and uh, and Google started uh, with. Uh, you know, uh, full attack with their large language models while Meta is uh, uh, trying to open source, open, open source uh, as much as they can. So uh, also they have the, this model Cicero, which they also open sourced. And it is interesting because it's not a fully large language model. It uh, has a, a 
language uh, generation part model, which is uh, actually pretty small comparing to these uh, uh, GPTs and, and uh, Boom and stuff like that, uh, but it works really well. Uh, the main idea is uh, uh, it is played in the, in the game of diplomacy, which actually uh, works like this. You have a, a six to eight players, and each player has some strategy, uh, some some move they want to to uh, to take, and then they negotiate with other players and try to see how to combine their strategy uh, and and to achieve diplom diplomatic victory. So uh, actually, it it has two parts. One part of the model is a text gen generation model, which is uh, used for this communi communication uh, along the the uh, parties. And uh, the other model is actually uh, more interesting. Uh, that's the model which uh, uh, goes under the bonnet and tries to see what is the strategy of of, of each. Uh, of each player. So this is uh, how the model actually works. Uh, first, it tries to define what would be the best uh, moves for the AI itself. Then it tries to uh, to identify what would be the best moves for each of the of the opposite players. And then it looks for the player with which uh, they would uh, uh, strategy. Would would be uh, in in you know combined. So, for example, uh, if if uh, I see that uh, the second player, uh, uh, the move of the second player is going to be beneficial for me too, uh, I would, as an AI agent, I would uh, um, notice that that uh, the other player and uh, ask them, okay, you have a strategy which is beneficial for me too. Would you like? to combine the strategies and to to uh, attack, for example, uh, the third party uh, together. So uh, the first uh, part of the model is the one which identifies the optimal strategy for each player. And the second part of the model is uh, the one which actually generates the text uh, to communicate with other players and to ask them uh, to combine strategies. So. Uh, that's the model which goes deeper uh, into the uh, negotiations because, uh, as, as um, uh, Jovan mentioned, and also uh, other other colleagues in the in the debate, uh, agents are not uh, in the neg negotiation. Parties are not just uh, the ones uh, which generate some text or, or generate some speech. They are really uh, made of flesh and bones, and they really have some other personalities and some other uh, uh, goals they want to achieve. So uh, in order to really have a negotiation, you need to go uh, beyond the text generation. You need to really have an agent and the model of the world and the agent who will understand how the, the that model works and to, uh, the model who, who tries to, to achieve some goal. Jovan, maybe on this point, uh, there is one interesting aspect. And this was, I was a bit nervous when I look into, mm. together with our AI team, Jovan leads our AI and data team in Belgrade. Uh, uh, I was nervous in a sense that uh, they miscommunicated uh, the, this was not really diplomacy. It's use of basically persuasion to get alliance and to conquer or kill or destroy the other country. This is typical strategy game. And uh, this strategy game uh, used the elements of territory, resources, people, those formalized elements, how many tanks you have, how many people you have, what are your resources, uh, what are your interdependence with other actors. It's all interesting, but what we are seeing from the current uh, crisis, unfortunately, all over the world, that there are limits of these uh, elements of uh, number of tanks or number of uh, military power, and there are some other some other elements. But main problem with matter communication was that it was reported all over the place, New York Times and everybody else, but it wasn't really about diplomacy. Diplomacy is peaceful resolution of conflicts. It is about uh, using negotiation to conquer land and to basically uh, impose your will on the other side. This is a military and then in basic and di distinction, this is difference between military using a force to impose the will on the other parties 
versus diplomacy using the negotiation for peaceful resolution of conflicts. That was a bit bit problematic uh, uh, communication of, uh, of Meta in this context. We asked them to join us today, but they couldn't. But um, I, uh, that's miscommunication in this respect. And I would say, uh, Jovan, you're more optimistic about this model, but I would say quantification in this model is useful, is is nice when you play the games, uh, like uh, strategy games, but it, it, it has limited application to reality of uh, complicated, not complex negotiations. Uh, exactly. I would agree on the both points. Uh, first point, uh, Matt had a couple of really great models. Uh, CICER is one of them. Uh, Galactica, for example, is the second great model, but they had a problem with uh, communicated that they communicated models in the wrong way. So uh, some very useful tool uh, got the bad, bad, bad uh, advertisement. Uh, on the other, on the other uh, side, uh, it's really great tool for the very interesting game and uh, we yeah. we spent a lot of time uh, uh, for the research purposes playing this game and trying to <laughs> to see how it works I and, thought that uh, you, you were working that you were playing games <laughs> in, the, in the AI team we have to <laughs> check it but uh, unfortunately um, in uh, as every game it's uh, representation it's it's a very simplified model of the real world so uh, things that work in this game uh, as much as impressive it looks, uh, it really wouldn't wouldn't uh, work uh, at, in, in the real world. So uh, first step is to create uh, a model which is much more realistic, and then we can uh, we can think of uh, some tool which would be useful in the real world. But uh, uh, it's interesting research. Now, just thank you, Jovan. There's just a quick glimpse from a very interesting work uh, last week I spent with our team, uh, AI and data team. And it's very interesting. We're combining uh, um, diplomacy, international relations, philosophy, linguistics, uh, AI, and what is very important, testing always uh, uh, findings and uh, having this reinforced learning by basically both learning ourselves as a humans, but also uh, asking machine and uh, making a sh machine learn based on our experience. And this is that concept of cognitive proximity that we are developing in order to prove uh, that humans, we can develop bottom-up AI and we don't need always to rely on just uh, a big data, large uh, language models. We can do a lot in bottom-up on smaller language models if we use them smartly. And if you have that uh, knowledge proximity between us and machines, uh, which we are trying to develop uh, a diplo. Uh, to cut, that would be all in this extra time from us, just quick, quick glimpse. There will be more coming from our AI and data team uh, on these things, uh, um, both as a practical outcomes of our research, but also as a, as a sort of conceptual insights we are we starting the having the like a ship has the log or diary. We starting creating diary because in the process of experimenting, we are finding much more interesting insights. What can be used and what are the limits of the AI and other tools? Definitely. Uh, cut. I don't know what is the process and the. <laughs> um, well, let's. I, I think let's close. We had an amazing discussion. Um, also in this in, informal chat, I took some notes uh, also on, on the different tools and in the follow-up email, we will share all of that. So everyone who's been watching and who's interested can, can follow up on these different tools. It's been a really interesting discussion. And I think one of my main conclusions is that we really have to walk the talk, as you say, Jovan, and really start exploring these tools um, in greater detail to have a very frank and open discussion and enable diplomats and policymakers to have these frank and open discussions um, as well. So I would end it there. Um, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure also to see under the bonnet what our own AI and data team has been has been doing. Thank you, Jovan. Um, thank you, AI team. And we will see each other next month with a debate on capacity building in the context of AI for diplomats and policymakers. So in a way, we will follow up right with the question that we're ending on next month. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Thank you for everyone who stayed with us and continued the conversation. As I said, we will follow up and 
stay in touch that way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao.